All right, so this is Messier 94 or NGC 4736. It's a rather beautiful looking spiral galaxy, about 16 million light years away. And it's at the center of a group of about 20 galaxies that we call the Messier 94 group. It's often called the cat's eye galaxy. But one cool thing about it is that it's got two ring structures. So there's sort of an inner ring and then there's this huge big outer ring as well. Now rings are pretty rare for galaxies. They're pretty rare structures. You don't see that many galaxies with, with rings. So the fact that you've got two rings is like, what? Except that bubble was burst back in 2009. So there was a paper came out that sort of was like unveiling the nature of M94's outer region. And they got really deep imaging on this galaxy. So they exposed for 555 minutes, which is a huge exposure. They showed the fact that it has this huge, big dispersed disk outside of what we just saw. So the image we just saw was just this central bit in the middle. And they're saying, actually, this bright white bit is what you then detect if you expose it for a really, really long time. And actually, they said that 25% of the galaxy's mass is actually in that disk as well. So there's a huge amount of stars in there for us to sort of like ignore since Messier made the list up until 2009. Turns out it's also not a ring, right? When you look at this disk structure, you actually find that it's a sort of extended spiral shape. And that outer ring that we saw in the first image is actually connected to that much fainter ring on the outskirts. Ah, uh, no rings at all. Well, it's got the inner ring still which are much more common to be fair than these big outer rings, the kind of things that like Hoag's object has. But this one is definitely just spiral structure. But this mass that they found in the outer regions, want to keep that in mind for later, right? Because the other thing I want to talk about is the mass in this galaxy too. So another paper on this galaxy, it's really a very popular topic in astronomy, this, this galaxy. This was by Yawoka and collaborators, and it's all about dark matter. Look how excited you look. I know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's talk about dark matter. So what they did in this paper is they looked at the rotation curve of this galaxy. This is where we look at the speed that the stars are moving at at different distances from the centre of the galaxy, right? So this is what Vera Rubin did back in the 60s, which is a rotation curve of Andromeda, for example, and that was the very first observational piece of evidence that we had for dark matter. But if we think about what this would look like, say, for the solar system, for example, right? If this is, a, you know, distance from sun, and we say that this is sort of like the speed that galaxies rotate, that's a V velocity. And, you know, if we think about Mercury, Mercury, you know, orbits very quickly, it takes like 88 days or something, right? So here's Mercury, then we get Venus at like 225, Earth at 365, Mars at double that, Jupiter 12 years, Saturn 29, Uranus, Neptune, etc. Right, the shape looks like that, right? Ish. <laughs> I joined those dots, right? <laughs> so the reason you get that shape in the solar system is because all the mass in the solar system is pretty much concentrated in the sun. So that's Newton's laws, Kepler's laws. It tells us that as you get further out, okay, yeah, those planets have got further to go in their orbits, but they also just move a lot slower in terms of speed as well. So if we think about when we look at a galaxy, where are the brightest points in galaxies? They're in the middle. Okay, so we'd expect a similar shape. They've also got a black hole in the centre. They though. have got a black hole in the centre, yeah, but a black hole isn't 99% of the galaxy's mass. It's still an appreciable amount, more than you would think. It's maybe something like a percent, but it's not the same sort of scale as the solar system. But when you do look at a galaxy's rotation curve, you don't see that. You don't see that shape at all. So if I draw it on our solar system shape, what Vera Rubin found way back in the 60s was that it did something like this, which is just the complete opposite of this. And if we think about what our understanding of gravity is telling us, so our best theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of general relativity, if we think about what that tells us of the distribution of mass in a galaxy, it means the majority of the mass in a galaxy is on the outskirts, not in the middle. But we just said that when you look at pictures of galaxies, it looks like the brightest point is in the center. The brightest point is where there are more stars. More stars means more mass. So when that was first looked at, these rotation curves, as people call them, that was the first evidence we had for dark matter. This idea that there's matter that is invisible to us on the outskirts of galaxies that we can't see. There's actually maybe even 10 times the amount of normal matter that you have that makes up stars, dust, gas, and everything else. It could just be boulders, couldn't it? Yeah, it could be anything. So this is the thing. So people at first thought, thought it was like a combination of all the black holes, all the neutron stars, all the failed stars, all the rogue planets, all the dust, all the gas. But when you make that calculation, it's nowhere near enough. It's only something like 10% of the invisible matter in the galaxy. It could even be those ducks over there. It could be ducks. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole family of them. They're science curious. That's why they've come to say hello. Yeah. Was that Dr. Becky? <laughs> <laughs> And so, well, that dog is getting really ferocious over there. Sorry. It just keeps bobbing down and bobbing back up again. What are they doing? 
It's all this talk of dark matter. They were like, no, no, don't agree with that. No. <laughs> what are they doing? I've never seen ducks do this before. Chill out, guys. Yeah. So the other thing that you can do, along with sort of saying, all right, let's rule out black holes and maybe let's you know hunt for a particle that it could be, is to say maybe we've got gravity wrong. Maybe Einstein's theory of general relativity isn't right, which is sort of a bold statement to make because everyone's always like, oh, Einstein, you know, Einstein was right. And in truth, like everywhere we've tested general relativity from the solar system to gravitational waves to around black holes, it's been perfect. But there are some people suggesting, well, maybe it just needs a little tweak. It can stay the same on solar system scales, but on the size of a galaxy, there's something that comes into play that changes it slightly. M94, though, is very controversial. And that's because its rotation curve doesn't look like all other galaxies' rotation curves. In fact, it has a rotation curve that suggests there's no dark matter in it at all. It's not leveled off in the way that we would have expected it to if there was all this dark matter on the outskirts. And obviously you've got different things going on in the middle because you've got the black hole there, you've got spiral arms, etc., etc. But essentially you don't have that leveling off. So like Newtonian physics could explain this thing. And so that's obviously thrown a lot of spanner in the works because not only do you not need dark matter for it, you don't need any of these modified gravity theories either. None of those can explain this. Well, I've just measured it wrong. I missed something. <laughs> so this was my first thought because... So this rotation curve, if you look, it goes out to 10 kiloparsecs, KPC, right? A parsec is about three light years or so, so a kiloparsec is 3,000 light years, right? But I was like, how far is that? Because this came out in 2008, and that paper we looked at before showing the big ring around the outside came out in 2009, a year later. This paper had the picture of the galaxy in it, right? And handily, it does have a scale for us here. You notice this, it says five, and then it has a little dash, mm. okay? So that means it's five arc minutes across. So five arc minutes is an angle. One arc minute is a 60th of a degree. So we're talking about the angular size of something on the sky. Say this is one arc minute, for example, something that's here, is gonna have a different absolute size to something that's here, right? That's gonna be smaller than this one. And just by basic trigonometry, if we know the distance to that object and we know that angle, we can work out how big the thing is, right? So thankfully we know the distance to this from its redshift. And so I worked out that at the distance of this galaxy, then this line, which is five arc seconds, is about six and a half kiloparsecs. This line is about three centimeters. So that three centimeters, six and a half kiloparsecs, if we want 10 kiloparsecs, we need four and a half centimeters, right? So then I was like, okay, well, let's see where four and a half centimeters goes to. And I was like, would you look at that? Four and a half centimeters is just that little bit. And this was the point that I got very excited because I was like, maybe they've not even looked at this bit where there was 25% of the mass at all. Maybe they've, you know, they didn't know about that then. And I was like, maybe we should be putting in telescope proposals, Brady, we should be writing a new paper about this. And then I remembered it's radius and not diameter. Actually, they're going from the very center and they're going out to four and a half centimeters, which covers that full diffuse thing. And I was like, oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> I was like, we were onto something there. It would have been amazing. But then I actually thought, well, if you look at this image, you can see there's lots of gaps that are just there because we see the spiral arms are shepherding material and so they do leave gaps in there. So perhaps these sort of dips and peaks in this rotation curve, they do sort of coincide if you measure it with these gaps in the data, right? So I was thinking, well, that also depends on how you take this data. So the way they get at this data is with what's called a spectra, right? You know, you take the light from the galaxy, you split it into its, you know, prism, its rainbow of light, and you see the features in that galaxy of the light, right? Usually the way that's done is with a slit. So you put literally a slit along your galaxy and you take the light in that little slit and then you can very easily split it and know which part of the galaxy's radius it came from. So it obviously what data you get therefore depends on where you put that slit. But if these sort of dips and everything in the where there isn't any stars are obviously affecting this rotation curve this much, this is one of those things that it's not going to be easy to get an average across the whole thing. So I'm only wondering whether what you should do instead of getting a slit is do what we, we talked about on this channel before, especially Mike, where you get this different type of spectral data, which is called an IFU, integral field unit, where you have this bundle of fiber optic cables that take a spectra in each one and you sort of mosaic or jigsaw piece the galaxy up. And then you can get the velocity that the stars are moving 
all across this entire galaxy. So basically you don't believe that the rotation curve is really different. I am approaching this with a healthy dose of science skepticism, right? <laughs> because every other piece of evidence we have from galaxies and from our simulations suggests galaxies have to have dark matter. And I'm not saying, you know, there could be, you know, never say never, there could be one that has somehow managed to do it, but it looks very similar to all the other ones that we know do have it. So yeah, I want to get IFU data on this. So the first thing I did was like, maybe somebody's already taken it. And I searched every IFU survey that I knew that was publicly available and I couldn't find it. So I still think, Brady, we should put a telescope proposal together. <laughs> I reckon we get really deep, really great IFU data on it. And we either show, yes, it's got dark matter because its rotation curves flattens off, or we just add more fuel to the controversy pile <laughs> and be like, actually, no, it has a rotation curve that suggests it doesn't need any dark matter in it at all. I'm up for it. Let's I'm do glad. It. I'm up for it too. Let's uh, do it. Next uh, round of proposals. Uh, <laughs> we'll all we'll put one in. All right. I'll write it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. That would actually be really helpful if you could write that. <laughs> You're not going to have one of these ANSI features. Except that M109 is an SC galaxy. So it's one of these ones with quite loose spiral arms. If we look back at the image again, you can see that there's lots of complex structure in there.